Hello everyone, welcome back to the Fundamental Theorem. In this video, I'm going to take, show you a completely different perspective on the topic of craft transformations. So if you're anything like me, then you probably took a class sometime in high school when you were told that if you had some function y equals f of x uh, that had, I don't know, some sort of a graph, let's just graph something that looks like that, right? And if you want to stretch this horizontally by a factor of two, you take this x and you replace it with an x over 2. So you get y equals f of x over 2. That's going to be the graph of this guy stretched horizontally by a factor of 2. So something like that. And, you know, my, my drawing is pathetic, uh, but you get the idea. So if you're anything like that, I mean, if, if you took a conventional class on functions or, you know, transformations or something, then, then you're probably familiar with this idea. But it always eluded me as to why we divide. You know, wh why do we divide over here? Why do we take an x over 2? And furthermore, why is this inside the parenthesis? Why is it something like half of x, f of x or something like that? I mean, this actually scales it down vertically, right? And that would sort of make sense, I guess. But there's a lot of intuition that's a little missing, right? So it's like we have, where's Waldo? I can ask you, where's intuition? And well, my job in this video is going to be to present a sort of intuition as to why this works the way it does. And I'm going to be using the idea of parametric equations and something known as linear transformations. So I'm going to briefly explain all of these. Uh, however, for a more detailed and extremely beautiful take on the subject of linear transformations and on linear algebra in general, I hugely recommend you check out 3 Blue 1 Brown's Essence of Linear Algebra series. I'm linking it in the description. It's it's incredible. It's mind-blowing. It's beautiful. Just like pretty much everything 3 Blue 1 Brown does. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Grant. So if you're watching this, I mean, huge shout out to you. Kudos. Uh, you're, you're amazing. Anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you what it means to first parameterize an equation. And then we'll get into vectors and matrices and all of the fun stuff. Yeah. So if I have an equation of the form y equals f of x, right? if I wanted, I could just say, let x equal t and let y equal f of t. This is exactly the same as this. These are identical. And this t is going to be what I'm going to refer to as the parameter. So it's just a real number, right? And it takes on values like you know, it starts at zero maybe, and then it goes one, two, three. Well, not one, two, three per se. It goes like zero, zero point zero 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 one zero 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 two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's 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 a real parameter, right? Not an integer valued parameter, not a natural number. It's a real number. Yeah. So anyway, uh, now we can just go ahead and write this in the form of vectors. So if I wanted, I could just say x y equals t and f of t, right? So if you have no idea how we suddenly went from, you know, I don't know, a system of equations, if you will, to a vector form, well, note that computationally, these are identical because when dealing with vectors, we equate things on either side of the equality sign this way. So everything on top is equal, right? Everything at the bottom is equal. So this is computationally exactly the same as what I did, but geometrically, by representing this idea of parametrizing the expression y equals f of x, we're able to do some pretty cool stuff. And this is where matrices come in. So for those of you who have no idea what a matrix is, a matrix would look something like this. You know, you enclose it in square brackets, or sometimes you use round brackets, well, I prefer square. And then you write something like A, B, C, D. Right? So this is what you call a two by two matrix. And essentially, uh, what matrices do is they encode something known as linear transformations, especially if you have these kind of nice square shaped matrices, right? So let's consider two dimensional space. Let's just draw out all of space, right? So this is X, this is Y. And well, essentially, space has what you call basis vectors. So I have one tiny vector here and one tiny vector here. And this vector is known as i hat, right? It's nothing but the vector 1, 0, 
and this vector is known as j hat. It's nothing but the vector 0, 1. And what these so-called basis vectors are is, well, if I had any vector like this, maybe this is the vector, uh, I don't know, 2 and like maybe 3 and 2. Right? Figures not to scale, but you get the idea. So if I had a vector like this, this can be represented as what's called a linear combination of i and j. So it's 3i hat plus 2j hat. That's, that's what this is. So essentially, we can represent any vector in this form. 3 is the horizontal component of the vector. 2 is the vertical component of this vector. And then we just write i hat and j hat, which are our so-called basis vectors, right? So what if I wanted to transform space? First of all, what does it mean to transform space? Well, maybe I want to stretch all of space horizontally by some factor, I, I, I don't know, let's call it k, right? In that case, think about what would happen to j hat j hat would remain unchanged, whereas i hat, i hat would instead become the vector k0. Why is that? Because this guy gets stretched all the way, and we multiply this one by a k, and this is nothing but a zero. I mean, the vertical component remains unchanged, of course. We're only transforming in one direction, remember. So this i hat would then take the position of k0. So I could apply a number of transformations, right? And you can express any of these transformations in terms of what would happen to the basis vectors. So suppose I wanted to perform a particular transformation that would take the vector i hat to the position, maybe I'll call this 2, 2, or something like that, right? Maybe this is 2, 2, and I want j hat to go to this position. Maybe this is going to be negative 3, 0. So maybe that's what I want my basis vectors, uh, that, that's what I want for my basis vectors to happen. And, um, well, what did you say? That's what I want to do to my basis vectors. Wow, my grammar is all over the place. But you get the idea. So if I were to do something like this, I can represent an entire transformation just by what happens to my basis vectors. And this is the idea of a linear transformation. Like I said, three blue one brown's explanation is much better so you, I, I've linked the video on linear transformations in the description. I, I suggest you check it out. Now, what we do is we represent this in the form of a matrix. So I draw a matrix, right? And I take this one. So this is where i hat goes. And I put that over here. So 2, 2. And I take what j hat becomes, negative 3, 0. And I put this together in the form of a matrix. So that if I wanted to apply this linear transformation to some vector uv, I could simply multiply the two. And just as we would be able to represent u and v, like this, this vector uv, uh, okay, uh, in the form of some linear combination of i and j, we would be able to represent it as a linear combination of these two guys as well. So this is nothing but u times 2, 2 plus v times negative 3, 0. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is actually the mechanism underlying matrix vector multiplication, right? So I hope this actually made a lot of concepts much easier for you to understand. And I'm going to explain how this is even relevant to the idea of graph transformations in just a moment, right? So we saw that maybe, maybe let's say, that we have this function y is equal to f of x, yeah? i equals f of x, and I don't know what it should look like. I'll make it look something like a cubic function of some sort, right? And maybe I want to stretch horizontally, so stretch by a factor of a, and stretch vertically by a factor of b. Well, what we can do is we can parametrize this in the form x, y is equal to t, and f of t, and we can encode this stretching action into a matrix in the form of a linear transformation. So if I were to stretch horizontally by a factor of a, then my i hat would go from 1, 0 to a, 0. Likewise, j hat would go from 0, 1 to 0, b, right? And essentially, this Right here, there's a linear transformation. So if I want to apply the transformation, all I have to do is multiply it to x, y. 
And this gives, just use a different color, this gives what? Uh, A0, zero, 0B zero times T and F of T, right? Which is nothing but T times A0, it's not a 9, it's an A, plus F of T times 0B. This is AT B F of T. You see? Now, if we wanted to get this transformation, we would have to set x, y equals to this, right? If we, if we ultimately want to graph this guy, uh, this expression alone is quite meaningless. We want x to become the transformed x, and we want y to become the transformed y. So if we set x, y, maybe I can call this x new, y new, or something like that, I don't know. If I say x, y is equal to a, t times b, f of t, now, if I want to convert this into a conventional form, what I can do is I can separate these out and I can say x equals a t, right? Giving, which is quite equivalent to saying that t equals x over a. Obviously, a is a non-zero parameter. It doesn't make sense to scale horizontally by a factor of zero, right? That would be changing the entire dimension, in fact. So, then likewise, I can say y is equal to b times f of t, right? But we know that t equals x over a. So we can simply substitute that here, and we get b times f of x over a. And this is consistent with what we would expect, right? If we were told that we're stretching horizontally by a factor of a and vertically by a factor of b, this is exactly what we would expect. And how did we arrive at this? We arrived at this by considering the geometric way to encode the transformation in the form of a matrix. And that made things, that, that, that's quite a beautiful way of looking at it. I mean, it might seem a little complicated, but if you really have the intuitions for what a linear transformation is, then this right here, will blow your mind, right? It certainly blew mine. And now, if you want to think of, you know, like uh, shifting actions, that's translation, right? If you want to move a graph around horizontally or vertically, well, you can encode that in the form of a translation vector. So if you take maybe IB max, then you're told that, uh, you know, if, if I want to move my graph, y is equal to f of t from uh, f of x, sorry, from here to here, then I have something known as a translation vector. And that translation vector is nothing but, oops, is, is nothing but this vector right here, right? So how, by, by how much am I shifting it horizontally and by how much am I shifting it vertically? So why don't I call the horizontal shift c and the vertical shift d? Then all I have to do is put these in the form of a vector. Right? And what I get is, I get x, y, oops, that's a bad bracket, is equal to t and f of t plus c, d, right? Now, again, we know x equals t plus c, which gives t equals x minus c. Now here we know y is equal to f of t plus d. And again, we know some, we have an expression for t, so we can simply plug that in over here, giving us y is equal to f of x minus c plus d. Again, quite consistent with what we already know, except now we actually have a reasonable and very logical explanation for why we subtract when we're moving to the right. I mean, this always eluded me. Why would we subtract if we're trying to move to the right? It, it didn't make any sense. But now, it, it really does make a lot of sense, right? It's because you're getting the parameter in terms of x and not x in terms of the parameter. So it's the parameter that's getting incremented, which means x must be decremented. This right here is the key. So, well, 
We're also told to look out for the order in which transformations are applied. And that really has to do with how we distribute our parentheses. So if you really want to think about it, a0, 0, 0, p, that's, that's not a 6, that's a 0, times t, f of t, plus c, d, is not equal to, or at least it's not necessarily equal to, a0, that's not a, oops, it's a 0, and a b, times t, f of t, plus c, d. And I'll leave it to you to actually do the algebra and figure out why this equality does not hold. And essentially, this is when you translate, then scale, whereas this is when you scale, then translate. So it really all becomes very clear, like everything, all of the pieces just seem to fall into place when you actually think about uh, graph transformations from the parametric point of view. It was completely insane. It, it blew my mind, as I've said repeatedly, but that I continue to say at the expense of repeating myself just to emphasize how, how remarkable uh, this insight is. Anyway, so you might ask, well, what if we want to rotate a graph. So what if I had a graph that looks something like this? And what if I wanted to rotate it and make it look like this? Well, how would I accomplish that? Uh, well, the answer again lies in the parametric equations. You can apply what's known as a rotation matrix. And how does a rotation matrix work? So if I want to, uh, if I have an I hat over here, let me use a different color. If I have I hat over here, and I want it to be rotated through maybe pi by four radians, right? Then what would I get? I would get my horizontal component uh, as nothing but the cosine of the angle and my vertical component uh, as nothing but the sine of the angle. You see what I mean? So using a little bit of trigonometry, you can come up with a rotation matrix that will identify the appropriate positions for I hat as shown here and J hat. J hat would remain perpendicular since you're trying to merely rotate and not scale or stretch in any other disproportionate manner, right? in which case this would take the angle of 3 pi over 4. In, in, in like no matter what angle this is, this will always be pi over 2 plus whatever angle, be, if you're trying to maintain this perpendicular property. But it's fine even if you aren't. That's the beauty of it. Linear transformations through matrices allow you to do pretty much anything you like with space, but there are certain important conditions and I'll, I'll, I'll let you watch the three blue one pound video for all the details, right? But you can do so much more using matrices than you possibly can using your regular Joe functions and what have you. So why do we have no straightforward, perhaps non-matrix related way to, I don't know, trans, uh, to, to rotate the equation? Let's say y equals x squared, just in terms, if I said if f of x is equal to x squared, just in terms of y and f of x. Well, the reason for that is actually quite elementary. If I wanted to rotate this through some angle, this would cease to be a function, you see. So that's the only reason why I, I, I couldn't do something like, uh, I don't know, y is equal to g of t, where g of t is somehow related to f of x, not g of t, g of x. Uh, the reason why I couldn't do this is simply because a rotated graph would no longer be a function. It's not always necessary that rotation preserves uh, the sort of one-to-one -one or potentially even one-to-many mapping. It could make it a many-to-one sort of a relationship. And that's something that uh, we want to avoid when we're dealing with functions per se, right? Uh, anyway, so that's pretty much it from me for this video. So this was quite a heavy video and I do understand that. Uh, so if you have anything that you would like me to clarify, please feel free to leave all your questions in the comments below. 
And like I said, do watch Essence of Linear Algebra by Three Blue One Brown. I mean, it's it's amazing. You know, you could just binge watch it like like a crazy person, like 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 someone like me, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I I hugely recommend it. And yeah, thank you so much for watching Fundamental Theorem. Do like, subscribe, and see you next time. Bye bye.